you had a restaurant burned down to the ground. What was the first thought that went through your mind? The first thing was Steve's face, a landlord. He looked at me and he's like, well, hey man, look, insurance does really good at these things. And I looked at him and I said, I'm fucked, Steve. I don't have insurance. He like literally looked at me and just started cursing. And I just like burst into tears. And it was the last money that my family had in savings and they gave it to me, they trusted me. And so my dad, won't even talk to me. And he's the reason why I got into entrepreneurship. My mom is pretty disappointed because she wanted me to become a doctor and I dropped out of school to start entrepreneurship. My friends think I'm a loser. I had employees that would be sending me, you know, threat messages every day because I hadn't paid them their last paycheck. And I'm like, all right, they're gonna beat me up. I gotta pay them somehow. It was $150,000 in debt. And I can still remember the first day I woke up with a $42 sale on my phone. It rocked and changed my world. January, 2022. We spend 320,000 and we make 2.3 million. Bashar, I want to start with you had a restaurant yes. burned down to the ground. What was the first thought that went through your mind when you showed up and saw that basically everything was rubble? Um, the first thing was Steve's face, actually, who was the, the landlord. <laughs> um, he, uh, <laughs> He looked at me and he's like, well, hey man, look, the, the, you know, the restaurant hasn't been doing, doing very well and uh, insurance does really good at these things. And I looked at him and I said, could we swear here, by the way? Yeah, okay. yeah, knock, it, knock yourself out. All right, cool. Yeah, I was knock like, yourself out. I'm fucked, Steve. He's like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> I was like, um, I don't have insurance. And oh. that's when he like literally looked at me and just started cursing. Because the thing is, I haven't paid Steve for the last four months. He's been like after me every single day, you know, serving me letters and all this stuff. And I'm just like, sure. And then, you know, I'll pay him here. I'll pay him there. Not because I didn't want to. The business was struggling and I just didn't have money. And as Steve is storming out, my dad is coming in and he comes up to me and, and my dad doesn't speak English very much, but he's like, I can tell your landlord is upset. What the hell is going on? And I just like burst into tears. And then he looked at me. He's like, I heard something about insurance. Do you not have insurance? So the first thought was, I'm fucked. You know, I don't have insurance. The place is down. I had just paid, I think, $10,000 to have the Manny Pacquiao and uh, Floyd Mayweather fight, uh, which happened in 2015. Uh, it was like literally all the savings that I had because I was counting on that fight to happen. This was, this happened Tuesday. The fight was going to happen, I think, Friday or Saturday. And I'm like, okay, oh. what can we do? Can we put this place back up together here in the next two days? And the, the, the fire marshal looks at me and is like, buddy, this is going to be here for a couple months. And so, yeah. Wow. And when you started that restaurant, we'll get into what you did next, but wh what was the reason you even started a restaurant in the first place? Did you think that was just the best business to start or where did that come from? <clears throat> so think about this this way. I was a, I'm a 23-year-old kid who you know who's partying seven days a week. And I'm thinking to myself, if I can find a place where I can have fun with my buddies and make money... <laughs> That is like the, the, the coolest thing ever, right? Watching this, don't do it. That's the dumbest thing ever. You don't want to do that. Um, luckily, I always, I never mixed pleasure and business. I had a lot of our, you know, uh, uh, customers coming up to me. And, and at the time I was single, you know, try to flirt with me and stuff like that, especially when it's, you know, one o'clock in the morning and they've had, like, you know, a, a six pack or whatever. Uh, of Bud Light, but I never did that. So that was a, a good thing. But it was kind of, that was the, the whole mindset behind it was mm -hmm. if I can find a place where I can make money and I can have fun at the same time, then that's great. But at the time I had three business ideas in my mind. Uh, my father owned the second largest factory of clothing in Iraq. So I wanted to start something in fashion because mm -hmm. he had lost everything. And I kind of felt obligated to bring that thing back in the family, something in fashion. I wanted to start a a spa, massages, that kind of stuff, uh, nail salon, barbershop, kind of like a mix of all, you know, yeah. this big project. And I want to do something in hospitality. And I decided to do the hospitality thing first. And um, unfortunately, it blew out before I have the chance to start the other ones. So the restaurant is down for the count. You don't have insurance. Walk us through a little bit of what happens next. I know what happened for the audience, you know, a little context of what did you do? First, I got into depression. <laughs> You know, that's the first thing. Um, that's where the mustache actually comes from. Because I grew a big beard, and then as I was coming out of it, I shaved the, must, uh, the, the beard and kept the mustache. Um, got a DUI about three and a half months after uh, because of that. Um, so spent the night in jail, and, and that wasn't fun. That wasn't the coolest thing ever. I started driving for Uber and washing dishes at Hilton Hotel because I had employees that would be 
sending me, you know, threat messages every day because I hadn't paid them their last paycheck and they all live in the same town. And I'm like, all right, these guys find me in the street. They're going to beat me up. I got to pay them somehow. So I get these two side jobs to pay them. But I remember going through this, this period of like two, three months of, I've always had big dreams. Since an early age, I always thought that I was put on this planet to do something big. I didn't know where it came from. I didn't know why. I didn't know what. It was just a feeling of like, I know I'm going to do something big in my life. And I always dreamt big. But during those two, three months after the restaurant burned down, I was like, mm, this is fantasy world. This is movie shit. This is like fairy tales. This is real life. It's struggle. It's bullshit. You get, you know, kicked in the nuts when, when you least expect it. And this is it. That's my life. Go get a job. I was actually offered a job at, uh, at Hilton Hotels, $60,000 a year uh, plus benefits, which at the time seemed like a lot of money, hmm. especially when I was $150,000 in debt. And I almost took the job. And so I kind of went into this rut. And sometimes I see people going in this and then they beat themselves down. But I feel like, you know, if you've just had a catastrophic event happen in your life, it's okay. If you feel like shit, it's okay. I don't know. We didn't talk about this, but two days ago, my Instagram page went down. Oh, it got I disabled. know how much traffic you run to that. Dude, 80% of our business goes through our, our Instagram. I think it wasn't it all of it? Did well, you... it was up until, because last year the same thing happened and we've been, you know, starting paid media and stuff like that to, to diversify they, our traffic. They just start disabling the accounts for no reason. I've no had reason. happen to me. No, no reason. reason. It goes down yeah. and then you have to sit and wait or maybe pay someone. Exactly. But what, what's the status right now? Um, I have a couple guys working on it. I was literally, that's why I kind of took a, a few minutes. I was in the lobby, you know, talking to a few people, you know, sending messages, contracts, that kind of stuff to try to figure it out. But on Monday, I woke up with that. Like 6, 6 a.m., I opened my phone, and it's like, your Instagram page has been disabled. I'm like, fuck. And so I took Monday, and my wife is like, I can't have you do this right now. Your energy is bringing me down. You got to mm -hmm. fix this. I'm mm -hmm. like, babe, give me the day. I feel like shit. Give me the day. Tomorrow morning, I promise I will shift it. And I've got kind of this process that I go to. It takes 30, 45 minutes. It doesn't matter what's happening. I, I bring me back, you know? But it's okay. If something catastrophic happened in your life, give yourself permission to go through shit and feel like shit. And that's okay. I feel like we need that time to mourn and to, to, to go through the motion. What's not okay is to stay there. Mm -hmm. Give yourself a limit. It's like, okay, I've got two hours. I'm going to do this. I've got a day. I've got a week. Whatever, the, whatever it is depends on what happened. Like if you lost a loved one, maybe a couple hours isn't going to do it. You know, but if like your Instagram page went down, it's like, all right, it's happened before. I'm gonna give myself a day tomorrow morning. I'm gonna fix it, you know? So that's kind of what I think about that. I think after you've been in business a long time, almost maybe like a marriage and things happen, you just get better and better at handling it. Because 100%. it's happened before. Absolutely. So, okay, so here's what I wanna go into next. So the restaurant burns down. Obviously everyone, most people who are watching this are gonna know you're the Amazon FBA guy. But for anyone who's listening who maybe wants to get into it, how did you come to that conclusion? Hey, here's what I want to do. And maybe start walking us through. How do you start picking products? How do you know which one to do? Which one did you sell for? Start with that. So I have this thing that I now call the discovery phase. I didn't even know that I went through it up until about a couple of years ago. Because people ask me this question all, all the, the time. time. It's like, dude, I go to YouTube and there is a million things I can do. Where do I start? You know? And that's how I did it. Number one, research for free. Because there's a plethora of free information out there for free, anything and everything there is that you can research. And that's what I did. I opened my laptop and I was like, all right, you're supposed to make me money, show me how. And I just went to YouTube and I started researching, right? Number two, pick the top three things that you resonate with. You know, for me, it was um, wholesale, flipping houses, uh, penny stock trading, and Amazon FBA. And then just follow these things for as long as you can. I say 30 days at least. You don't want to go too long, but 30 days at least. For me, it was probably about like two months or so. Mm. But I think I kind of went too long. And then after, drop two things and focus on one. So I dropped wholesaling. I took a, a course. I remember I took a course actually on all three. I dropped two, and then I kept Amazon FBA. Mm. And then you want to find one person that you're like, all right, I resonate with this person and go all into their teachings. For me, it was this, you know, a 17, 18-year-old kid that was driving a Lamborghini. He used to piss me off. Because he was a kid in a tank top driving around in a Lamborghini when I was a 25-year-old kid with a real business experience under my belt, not successful, and this kid was successful. And I'm like, what the fuck does this kid have that I don't? Mm -hmm. 
and focus on that person's teachings. Because regardless what it is you're trying to do, someone else has done it before you. And instead of going through it through trial and error, like that's the only shortcut to success. Pick it back on someone else's success. So for me, it was buying the course, shittiest course that I took in my life, but it showed me the, you know, the two or three things that I, that I didn't know how to do because I tried to do it on myself. I launched three products and all three failed. Uh, cause I was like, well, if this could, can do it, I can do it. My ego was, you know, bigger mm -hmm. than this place. And, um, and then finally I, I admitted to myself that this guy knows something I don't. And if I want to make it happen, I need to pay attention to them. Do you think most people have that same mindset that they don't need any help and yes. they stay stuck there? Oh, dude. Why do, why do you, why do you think people do that? And is, is that part of why you got into coaching? 100%. The reason why. It's ego, for me at least. We all have ego. And I think a, a degree of ego is necessary, right? Because you can't not have ego, then you'll get yourself in trouble. But having too much ego will even get you in a lot more trouble because what happens is when you have that ego, you now don't have that bigger mindset anymore. And unfortunately, that happened to me after I hit, I hit eight figures and after I was praised everywhere I went and I was the guy that grew uh, a personal brand from zero to two million followers in like a record time and whatever. And, uh, and everyone was telling me that how great I was and then that ego came back to me and I ate shit. And so we have to make sure that we understand that our ego exists, keep it in check and be aware of it and, 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 and be aware where it's holding you back and when it's actually needed in a situation where it was needed, I was being held hostage by an agency that was running my traffic the first year, uh, second year of, of business. And they said, unless you comply with us and do it the way that we want it to be done, then we're not going to run your stuff. And that's when I needed my ego to show up and say, you know what? Go fuck yourself. Hmm. Just like I found you, I can find someone else. I fired them and I went and figured it out by myself. So a degree of ego is necessary, but it's really important to understand that it can hold you back. It's held me back more times than I can think of. And I know it holds a lot of people back as well. So you start, you go from the restaurant, 2015, you start Amazon FBA. You do that for about four years before yes. you finally start BJK University, correct? So during those first four years, what are some of the things you learned or some of the things you sold? So for anyone listening that maybe wants to get an Am Amazon FBA, but they don't know how, walk a little bit through that journey before you actually start teaching it. So I started with this thing called arbitrage, um, and that's where you flip products pretty much, kind of like what Gary Vee talks about all the time, you know, but I didn't go to garage sales. I went to, uh, you know, TJ Maxx, Home Goods, and I think Home Depot, and uh, I would buy products there. I had a criteria, so I had to, you know, at least the, the difference between what I can buy it for and what I can sell it for has to be at least $10, $12. Uh, the listing on Amazon can't have more than 10 competitors, and uh, reviews can't be more than 300 reviews on the listing. So I'd buy products on these stores and I would flip them on Amazon. And I can still remember the first day I woke up with a $42 sale on my phone. It rocked and changed my world, you know, because up until now I was, I was always, I grew up in, in retail. You know, I, I worked in restaurants since I was 16. I migrated to America when I was 16. I got a job at McDonald's right away. And since then until uh, Amazon, I had worked and owned restaurants. And it was always, you know, you got to buy the food, prep the food, serve the customer, clean after them for you to make money. Where here, I literally made money in my sleep. And I was like, holy shit. Okay, well, if I can sell one unit in my sleep, can I sell five? Can I sell 10? Can I sell 50? Right? And that's when I became obsessed. The problem with arbitrage is that you have to consistently be finding new products. You have to be consistently going out to stores. I had a suspended license, so I couldn't drive. So now I'm, um, um, you know, I'm, um, I'm, um, uh, uh, slaving out my my girlfriend using her mom's SUV to go drive around. Now here here's the funny thing: I don't have a credit card. I don't have technically don't have money. I'm using my wife's credit card, and until now she's like, since I met you, my credit score has gone down and blah blah blah. She had like a <laughs> flawless credit score, and then because her credit credit limit would keep going up or the balance would keep going up, her credit score was like going down. She was freaking out. Um, and uh, so that's kind of how it started. And then from there, I was like, all right, this is cool. I love this, but I want something more scalable. As I started making more money, I was looking for something more scalable, something that I can, you know, do and work from anywhere in the world. 
And that's when I discovered private label FBA, which is when you um, go to the manufacturers directly and buy a product, brand it yourself, and sell it on Amazon as your own product rather than selling someone else's product. The cool thing is you can sell 500 units of this a month. You can sell 1,000 units of this a month where the initial strategy, if, if I wanted to sell 500 units a month, it would be of like 20, 30, 50 products. I don't have to physically go and buy these units. So that's how kind of I started my journey with Amazon. And did you learn that in a course or was it really through trial and error? Um, a lot of it was... None of it was through trial and error. A lot of it was just researching on YouTube, especially the arbitrage side of it. There weren't any courses, at least that I knew of, that were talking about it. There were a couple podcasts that I listened to, but the private label I learned through it. I learned the, the free stuff, mm -hmm. but I didn't make it happen until I bought a course. That makes sense. And then for anyone who's listening, as you're selling it, how were you selling it? Because I think where a lot of people get caught up on is, okay... Yeah, I can go find a product, but how do I get enough traffic to sell it? People ask me that. So this is a great question. The other question I get always asked is, why did you choose Amazon? And so to answer both of those questions in one, 56% of all traffic, of all online sales happen on Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. 56%. Over 30 million people, that was a stat in 2015 when I started. Right now, that number is over 500 Million people shop on Amazon every single year, spending between twelve hundred to fifteen hundred dollars. Over forty-seven percent of Amazon sellers have reported making a profit, and over seventy-five percent of those have reported making over a hundred thousand dollars in profit. So, for me, as a twenty-five-year-old kid who's got one hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt, who's never done anything online, these stats were very attractive to me, right? And so. For me, it was just a matter of the traffic's there, which is the biggest problem any business has. All I need to do is find the right product. Well, there is over 12 million products active on Amazon and over 300 million people come into the Amazon platform to buy these products. I just got to find one. And I just got to find about 300 people per month to buy my product out of 300 million. I don't even know what that is, like 0.000001%, right? And so for me, it was like, all right, it's just a matter of numbers. And the math makes sense. If the math makes sense, I just got to go find that product. Unfortunately, my first three products failed because, again, I thought I could do it by myself. And then it wasn't until I bought that course and it showed me a few things that I was missing. And then the fourth product succeeded, fifth product succeeded, and then... So know. if I'm hearing you correctly, the difference between Amazon FBA versus maybe, quote unquote, a normal business where you're not fulfilling on Amazon is that I might have to buy my traffic on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. And then what you're saying is that because there's so much organic traffic coming already, you don't necessarily have to go spend that money on ads. Is that accurate to say? 100%. I knew nothing about this world. And so for me to figure out how to find traffic through Facebook, Google, whatever, how to find product, how to fulfill the product, because that's the other thing that Amazon does is you're sending all of your products to Amazon's warehouse. Amazon does the fulfillment for you, does your customer service. They ship your product. They store your product. They do all that stuff for you. They handle returns. It's like, okay, all I really need to do is find the right product. That's literally it. So what's the key thing to getting ranked high? Because I'm <laughs> assuming that's going to play the biggest part. Is it picking a unknown product that just has less competition? Is it picking a super competitive product, but then you have key things you can do to rank it higher? What's really the overall or the best strategy if you're new to Amazon, you're trying to rank your product high? It depends on your goals. Someone watching, if you're say, if you have $10,000 a month in your, in, your, in your mind, it's like, okay, I want to make $10,000 a month online. I would say picking a random product that you know can generate between 300 to 500 units that has moderate to low competition. For us, it's reviews. We look at the reviews and we say, <clears throat> at least top 10, at least four of them need to have less than 300 reviews. That's a moderate to low competition. And it should sell between 25 to $45 as your sell price. That is the equation to make you $10,000 a month. Now, for us, we've been selling for almost a decade. I launch products with fifty dollars to $100,000 in budget, minimum. And that's not my criteria. My criteria is I want a product that sells for at least 80 bucks or more. I'm, I'm okay with competitors having thousands of reviews, but I also want to make hundred grand a month with that single product, right? 
So it's a different criteria and depends on where you're starting. Even if you have a lot of money, even if, you know, we have a lot of students coming to us and it's like, hey, look, money's not an issue. I've got 50 grand, I've got 100 grand ready to launch. We still start them there because you're still a, a newbie to launching products. So get started with this, make it successful, even if it's not the kind of money that's going to wake you up at, you know, in the morning excited, get your few reps and then go to launch the, the you know, play in the big boys league, you know? So... You start Amazon FBA. You've been doing it for a few years. Correct me if I'm wrong. You go to about 2019. Then in 2019, you roll out BJK University, which in short is you're showing other people exactly what you did to be successful on Amazon FBA, correct? 100%. So what was the shift that made you go from, hey, I'm doing Amazon FBA. I don't know how much you're making at the time. Feel free to share if you want, but you were doing that for about four years and then you made that switch. What entailed in that time period that made you want to start shifting to teaching people what you were doing? Yeah, absolutely. So at the time I was, it was in 2018 was my first seven figure year in revenue. Uh, 2019, uh, did about three and a half, four and a half million in and revenue. Keep in mind for everyone listening, this is products. So, you know, you're selling stuff, what, $80 you said, or $50. Yeah, and yeah this is thousands of units. Yeah, thousands and yeah, thousands of units, of units yeah, yeah. which is very different from, <laughs> you know, the high ticket world I'm in where you're selling very low units, but very high prices. So keep Yeah, going. yeah. So these, these are under $100 products, mm -hmm. you know, so this, these are thousands of units being turned every single month, uh, every single year. I had gone into kind of a, into hiding for about two and a half, three years, <laughs> uh, because honestly, I was ashamed and I was embarrassed because I was always the, the guy that talked big game with my friends and I'm like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make a big stuff like that. And when my restaurant burnt down and I lost everything, it was the last money that my family had in savings. And they gave it to me. They trusted me to go start this business. Cause mm -hmm. we had a, we had a restaurant prior to that, that was a family business. And then I wanted to branch out. And so my dad won't even talk to me. And he's the reason why I got into entrepreneurship, right? My mom is pretty disappointed because she wanted me to become a doctor and I dropped out of school to start entrepreneurship. My friends think I'm a loser. And even, so, even with your success so far, like even, even though you've sold millions of dollars. I'm and talking before that. Oh, even before, so before that. that okay, right? Before so that. before that. So I, I go into hiding, right? I literally blocked all of my best friends on my phone. So that way no one calls me because the minute they call, it's like, hey man, how you been? What you been up to? And it's like, I'm fucking washing dishes. I don't know what, what do you want me to tell you. You know what I mean? And so I go into hiding. I discover Amazon and I'm successful two, three years later and I come out of hiding and now I'm showing up to the places where they, you know, the hookah lounges and all that stuff where we all hang out. You do love some shisha. Oh, dude, I love some hookah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, they're asking like, okay, you're driving a nicer car. You know, you're showing up. You look like you're fine. You know, like what's happening? And I start talking about what I'm doing. And I'm, you know, it's like an exciting kid. It's like, look at what I've got and that kind of stuff. Because now it's like I've got something to talk about, to feel good about myself. And then a few friends started asking, well, shit, I've been hearing about this. I didn't know you were doing it. Show me how. Few friends heard, few friends heard. A couple people, you know, I, I would just jump on calls, Zoom calls. I would charge people some, some I wouldn't, you know. I didn't have a course, didn't have anything, didn't have a YouTube channel, didn't have anything. And then that's when I, you know, realized that maybe I should make a YouTube channel. And I started making some videos. A friend of a friend or someone paid me a few hundred dollars and I built some course for him and he went through the program. This is Zach Brown, if you're watching. I talk about him a lot. I teach him a bunch of stuff. He goes away, he disappears. He comes back about six months later. He sends me a message saying, Bashar, you're the fucking man. In the last six months, I've made $36,000 in profit. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit. Yeah. I was like, damn, I should have taken a piece of this business. <laughs> you know? <laughs> The thing that was going through my mind, and I remember uh, I was married at the time, so that's my girlfriend, now is my wife. She comes up to me, she's like, aren't you jealous? I was like, no, why do you say that? She's like, well, I mean, how much did he pay you? I'm like, I don't know, like 400 bucks? Like, you just made him 36 fucking grand in six months. I'm like, shouldn't you have like a, a bigger piece of his business? And I started thinking about that. And the thing that dawned on me is this. It wasn't the money that I made from him or the money he made is what that money now did for him. This is a 22, 23 year old kid who was into dirt biking and he wanted to travel the country and go into tournaments, but was a FedEx driver driving 12, 13 hours a day and couldn't do that. Now he was able to do that. And that's when things clicked for me. And I was like, not, a, not only can I do this for myself and clear my debt and, and, and provide my family a better life, I can do that for other people.
and I can do, you know, I can make a decent living out of it. Cause I'm like the guy that's so, like, I bought courses to get here. So there's this thing that it's called courses that I can teach people. Like it's not a foreign language, you know, it's, it's a world that exists out there. And then as I started taking more courses, I started realizing a lot of these kids don't even know what the hell they're talking about and launching all these courses. And I'm like, well, shit, why don't I get into this game? And it was more of the fulfillment part of it that really drove me into it. And then obviously it became a very successful business. And now that's my main focus. Well, and it's funny you say that because what I love about your story is <clears throat> I relate to that is you don't actually go out looking to teach people. It's that you actually had success. And then as you have success, people want to know what you're doing. And as you start telling people, at least in my, what happened to me, and I'm sure you can relate is you just start realizing, oh my gosh, all these people want to pay me money and they want help. And for me, I think going to your point, it, it feels very fulfilling to, you have a bigger impact. You just have a bigger impact because instead of you just making money, all these other people are making money because of you. So you start BJK University, right? It's 2019, it's 2024. It's been going about five years. Uh, you've done crazy numbers. So we'll just say eight figures. Uh, you can re relay how much if you'd like, but you've been doing that for about five years. I, I'd like to talk more about how that business works now. So obviously we talked about the Amazon side. Now you're in the consulting side. I think people would find it interesting. Talk about basically until recently, I know you're having some issues with it, but I remember even years ago, you only have one traffic source. Yeah. You have a very simplified business. Talk a little bit about how your business works. You know, how you run the traffic, how you get uh, the leads, how you, you know, work the leads, the sales team. Talk a little bit about how your business works in general. Yeah, for sure, man. So this was 2019, got into the business 2020. I uh, tried to kind of do all kinds of stuff. Uh, Sam Ovens was the man that really helped me get off the ground through his courses and, and, and masterminds and stuff like that. And it was, I started with Facebook ads and then started getting shut down. I went to YouTube, couldn't figure that out. I hired an agency. They couldn't figure it out, you know, make it profitable. And as I was firing them, uh, my exit interview, um, the, the account manager was like, hey, dude, uh, have you heard of this thing called Instagram shoutouts? And I was like, no, what the fuck is that? He's like, I don't, there's this thing where there's this guy and uh, he, he places ads on these pages. They drive traffic to his, you know, to his page. And then he said he's spending $10,000 a week and making 40,000 back. I was like, shit. Well, I, I haven't heard of that before. I'm spending, you know, 50,000 a month making 51,000 a month. You know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, I should check it out. So this was like, um, I think September of uh, 2020. So then I go to Instagram and I'm like, all right, well, what's this about? So I start running my Instagram page. Earlier in the year, I had a, an agency kind of like running my Instagram page, not successfully. So I kind of take that over and then I start doing Instagram shout outs. So I talk to a few pages and I'm just like, here's an ad, put on your page, drive traffic to my page, and I'm posting on my stuff. Nothing really happening. Two months go by, nothing really happening. One of the pages reach out to me. He's like, look, I see what you're doing. I love what you're about. I think you're doing a shitty job and I can do a better job. Pay me $600 a month plus 15% of whatever we generate here. Um, so 15% of gross profit and let me do it. I was like, okay, fuck it. You do it. This is October, I think of 2020. November, 2020, I decide that I want to shut down social media and I want to go all into YouTube ads and figure that world out mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you guys got 30 days because I'm shutting everything down. I used to post, I think, 25 times a day. Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, uh, everywhere. LinkedIn, everywhere, right? I was following Gary V. Gary fucking said post 25 <laughs> times a day. I was posting 25 times a day. Story, literally everything, bro. And then I was like, this is just not catching traction. I've been doing it for the last two years. It's not going anywhere, you know? And I was like, I just want to run ads. I want to do YouTube because Facebook is shitty. I want to run YouTube. And uh, I was like, you guys got 30 days because I'm going to shut down the channel. That 30 days, they spent, I think, 5000 on ads and we made 12000 back. I was like, okay, we'll go another 30 days. That second 30 days, we spent, I think, like, I don't know, 20 or something. And we made like 60 or 70. I was like, shit, okay, well, this is something. January 2021, we spent, I think, 40-something thousand and we make like 150-something thousand. Oh, January 2022, we spend 320,000 and we make 2.3 million. Oh my gosh. So this is in a 12 month period. We go from 150,000 a month to two and a half million dollars a month. And, and break down real quick because some people may not get it. Originally, 
you were doing it yourself, meaning you're outreaching <clears throat> to pages and saying, yes. hey, let me pay you X amount in return. And then what you did is you found, I guess, for lack of a better word, a middleman yes. who has these connections with the page to say, hey, look, let me do it. And whatever he was doing or whatever pages he was pushing worked a lot better than what you were doing. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it goes back to the uh, to the one principle that I've had for the last four years. And that's the focus, uh, the, the principle of focus. Um, that person's job was to find pages, to create promos that converted. And that's it. My job was that and fulfillment and sales and, you know, finance and this thing Absolutely. and running my Amazon business. Yeah. So that person had a singular focus and that's why they did a better job uh, than, than I did. Essentially, the strategy, if you break it down is, and, and, you know, right now it's a little more popular than it was a couple of years ago, but essentially the strategy is you make posts on your page. So that's how we did it. We make posts on our page. The posts that do better than the other posts, so we were posting six times a day. The posts that did better, that, you know, better engagement, better conversion, we take those and we convert them into ads. All we're doing really is just changing the CTA. Mm -hmm. And the CTA is from, you know, DM me this word or click the link in my bio to follow my page. And then we have a network of pages at our peak. We had about 350 pages promoting us every single day. We would take that ad and we would give it to all these people and just say, post that as an ad on your page, telling people to follow our page. And so now we are getting followers to follow my page. And that's how our page grew by like a million and a half in like a year or something like that. Um, and then from there, we are converting them into clients through our content. So the only thing this page is doing is driving traffic to our page. And then our page's job is to convert them to clients by driving them through a VSL funnel. So a video sales letter funnel, opt-in, video, calendar, uh, uh, survey, calendar, sales team. Yeah, and then from what I remember, you had a massive sales team, correct? Uh, yeah, not the smartest thing to do. Uh, we scaled our sales team to about 70 people in about three and a half months. The dumbest thing that we've ever done. Wow. One of the dumbest things we've ever done. And we can go into, you know, further if you want about why that was dumb and some of the lessons learned. But yeah, we at, at our peak, we had uh, eight, seven pods or eight pods of six to eight people. Uh, in each for wow. the the sales team, and you know that's we were doing about two thousand opt-ins a day with about one hundred fifty two hundred calls a day. Um, that was our peak, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Do, do you did you have a bigger sales team because you think you let too many calls on the calendar possibly, or why did you have such a big sales team? I mean, obviously the <laughs> volume's there, but is there? Do you feel like that volume was? I guess, higher quality, or did you just let everyone come on and let the sales guys fight it out? Like, what was the thought process behind that? So it was a combination of a few things. The first thing was because there was, my leadership team was a bunch of visionaries and no, you know, no tactical Execution. integrator, you know, type of people. I was a visionary. I am a visionary. My sales director is a visionary. The marketing uh, director at the time was a visionary. And uh, um, I guess my op ops, you know, ops director is an, uh, an integrator type, but he was more of like, he, at the time, he was more of a yes man. Mm -hmm. um, and he was like, give me whatever the fuck you need. I'll make it happen type of thing. And we didn't have kind of like, uh, like, and we were all a bunch of young kids. You know, I, I mean, I say young, but I wasn't young, but I was young in business. Mm -hmm. You know, I am a, uh, right now I'm 34, but I was about 30 years old, 31 years old. And um, I never made that kind of money or had that kind of responsibility or that kind of business before, right? My uh, director of marketing was a 22, 23 year old kid, never had a business in, in his life. And so for us, we had 10 X our business in the previous year. And so the immediate thing was, okay, we went from 150 to 200 to 2 million in, in one year. Let's go to 10 million this year per month. And um, to do that, we need this many leads. We need this many sales team. So go hire, I'll go work on my leads, and then I'll see you at the top. Um, dumbest thing, um, the company had no infrastructure, zero. Because again, this was a $100,000 a month business. Mm -hmm. And it just 10 x It didn't have the infrastructure to sustain it there. Mm -hmm. And now we want to 5X again. Mm -hmm. It's like, dude, that's just the recipe for disaster. Now, I don't want to say luckily, but we never were able to reach the 10 million we started declining because of, you know, because of that and because of the marketing just couldn't produce more. That that strategy got us there, but it wasn't what's going to get us to the next level. And we didn't, you know, we thought, okay, because we got here, we can go here. Let's just spend more. Let's do more. And oftentimes, at a certain level, more gets you more. 
at a certain level, better gets you more. Mm -hmm. And you need to do, not better, different gets you more. Mm -hmm. You know, hard, w working hard only can get you to a certain level. And then you kind of need to, you know, there's a cliche saying of working smart. It's just working different. Like right now, I work a lot less than I did three, four years ago when I was making a lot less money, but it's just different kind of work. Mm -hmm. You know, we thought more will get us more until more just started getting us less. Yeah. So let's just talk about even when you were at 2 million, which for most people, they can't even fathom that. They want to make that in their lifetime. So even at 2 million a month, what did that team look like? So we know you <clears> scaled <throat> to 70 reps, but did you have 20 reps, 30 reps? How, what did that size team look like? Um, so when we hit 2 million, I think we had about probably about 40 reps or so, 45 reps. Um, I can't remember wow. exactly just because it all happened so quickly. Like we skipped a lot of business levels very quickly, you know, because businesses usually have breaking points and we skipped like three breaking points. I think last time we looked at it, um, in, in like less than a year. So it was probably between 25 to 45. I honestly couldn't, I can't remember, uh, because we, we had like a lot of people in the pipeline being hired mm -hmm. and onboarded, mm -hmm. you know, like every day we would have one or two reps get on the calendar, wow. you know, now our something that I'm very proud of is our recruiting system and onboarding system was really good, you know? Uh, we had a solid system there, but the, the sales team was about, again, between 25 to 45. And this, the process was very simple. I uh, use shout outs to our Instagram page, content on the page, convert them, go to the VSL funnel, no setters, uh, VSL funnel, booking on the calendar, yeah. sales reps, you know, going through the, the it was one program for, uh, at the time was, uh, 48, I think it was 38, and then we went to 4,800. Either paid in full or uh, two pay or three pay. No financing, uh, nothing, nothing. It was, it was very simple, you know? And I would, I would do, so I would do content for Instagram and I would do one YouTube video uh, per week, uh, just content about Amazon or whatever. And that's it. Like that literally was all of our business. That's it. Yeah, so for everyone listening, just so you understand, that business model for it to work as well as it did, is I would say abnormal. Yeah, uh, yeah I don't know. Too, that, Bashar is one of the only guys when he told me his traffic source and he had no setters and he had a sales team and I'm doing two million a month. I, I would scratch my head because no one in the industry, as far as I knew, was doing it. So around this time, I want to say, let's say it's 2021, 2022, somewhere in that range. At least what I've experienced in my business, and this is what I'm curious about, is we've gotten to about, you know, between 1.5 to 2 million a month. That was our peak. And then I was in the same boat where, Hey, just more, 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 more. And around that time, I really noticed that at least since that time, I've noticed, uh, this is when COVID is starting to come down and more people are maybe going back into the workforce. IG shout outs don't seem to be the same as they are now, excuse me, as they were back then, uh, more competition, stuff like that. So I guess I'm curious besides the sales team, we'll just put that to the side. Obviously we get that what do you think was the biggest bottleneck? Is it the fact that Instagram chat stopped working as well? Is it the marketing's getting harder? Is it more competition? What, like what, what was the bottleneck outside of the sales team? Because that's what I think people be curious to hear about. So a couple of things, this is very emotional for me because, uh, looking back, it's like hindsight's 2020, but looking back, it's like, we made every single mistake in the book. And although I had mentors around me that year, 2022 was our biggest year. And I also invested over $600,000 in coaching masterminds, wow. mentors, one-on-ones in a year. In a year. Wow. I, I was in Tony Robbins inner circle. I was in Russell Brunson's inner circle. I was, have, I was doing one-on-ones with Dean Graziosi, Ty Lopez, Dan Locke. I mean, every single Jeez. person that I knew and it was the best strategy, but it was the state of mind that I was going into it because in my mind, it's like, all right, I'm here. I know the only shortcut to success is learning from other people and avoiding mistakes. Okay. That was perfect. So who's way ahead of the game and, you know, than, than I am, let me go learn from them mm -hmm. because I believe in learning vertically than horizontally. So that was a great strategy. The state of mind that I was in going into these calls and into these sessions was on the shit ego. So the ego had come back and I, I no longer had the beginner's mind anymore. Sam Ovens, who was the person that I looked up to all the time. I started thinking, I've probably overgrown this guy. You know, I need to kind of look at other things. Mm. And now looking back, that was the dumbest fucking thing that I had ever done. Although I asked them for advice, I didn't do what they said. I remember the first call I got on with Dan Locke. Now, Dan Locke, I, I think, I don't know, I think had built one of the largest, you know, coaching businesses in our industry. Yeah. Um, 
And when we were growing, we were growing with his team. That's when he was falling. And literally all of his, half of his team like came to our company. Oh, no way. My marketing, uh, my director of sales actually was one of the Unlock's leaders and then came over to our company. And so I was like, all right, I don't want to do that. So let me learn from Dan Lok. And that's why I had one-on-ones with him. The very first thing I remember him telling me, he said, the worst number in business is the number one. I was like, okay, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, what in your business right now is one? I was like, well, fuck everything. I've got one offer. I've got one traffic channel. I've got one, one sales funnel. I've got one of everything. And I was very proud of that because I was like, yes, that's my... That's my principle of focus. I remember though. I remember having that convo with you and you telling me that. And I, I don't know if you remember, but I was mind blown. I'm like, what? You're kidding me. And you're like, yeah, won well, this, won well, that. And I yeah, was like, yeah. this guy is crazy. And he's got 2 million. I, I, I just never exactly. seen anything like it. Yeah. Exactly. And it, we even joked around about it. We said, you know what? I'm going to actually launch a book. And then the book is going to say, you know, how to 2 million a month or something like that. And then the book is going to have one page is going to say focus. The end. Like literally, I still remember we were talking yeah, about it. Like it kind of got a little serious too, yeah. you know? And he said the number one. So that was the first thing. Then I got another, another aha moment when, when I read the book by uh, Ray Dalio, where he talks about how the last three or four empires, the Dutch empire, the British empire, and then the, the Chinese empire, and then now the American empire rose and fell. I forget the, uh, the, the name of the book. It's a big old 700 page book. And he talks about uncorrelated, uncorrelated, uh, things uncorrelated. He really talks about investing and that kind of stuff, like how to create uncorrelated avenues where if one thing goes up, it doesn't impact the other thing. So was that, and then the last thing was, um, also Ray Dalio at a Tony Robbins event talking about how things Things don't last, good or bad. And whatever it is you are doing, understand that it won't be like this forever. So it was these three points that I had coming to me, but it was because of the state of mind that I was in, I was repelling them because of the ego. And I was like, no, I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. Now looking back, if I had focused on even one of those three things, we wouldn't have had the downturn that we did. And that was number one, having one traffic channel is unsustainable. It's great to start. You don't want to start with five different things, 10 different things, because you only have a specific amount of time and energy. So focusing on the one thing was really good. But then there was an, a point in time where now you need to start looking for new things. Because like you said, IG shout outs were, you know, we were, we were getting six to eight X return. Right now we're, if we get a, if we get three X, we're like, holy shit, that's a great freaking month. You that's know what I mean? Changed. And so for us, it was not, seeing and believing that what goes up continues to go up and that what got us here is going to get us there and is going to continue getting us there instead of looking for those, you know, Sam Ovens talks about the S curve, right? It's like understanding when you are on the way up and then coming up with a new S curve, because if you ride the S curve all the way up, it's going to come down crashing, mm -hmm. right? So those were kind of the different points where you have to understand and, and, and make sure that your ego is not getting in the middle and, and, and thinking that, you know, more than people that have gone through and made it to the other side, you know? So what has been the biggest changes since that time? Because I, and, and to be fair to you, I, I can almost guarantee every entrepreneur, it seemed like around COVID, all that stuff started to kick in. Shout outs, less effective marketing's getting more expensive, more competition. That's at least how it has seemed to me. So if you could go back. Yeah. You got that advice. If you could go back, what would you have done differently that you didn't do at that time? Um, nothing. Because I wouldn't have the mindset I do right now if I did. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I have no regrets and I'll never change anything. Just because what I know today, trying to explain it to Bashar then wouldn't have worked mm -hmm. because half a dozen, you know, millionaires and, and one of them is a billionaire try to explain it to me and it didn't work. So it's like sometimes you just have to touch the stove to find out that it's fucking hot. Yeah. You know, n no matter how many people tell you it's hot. Looking back in hindsight, we got here, stop growing. And that is the toughest fucking thing you can tell an entrepreneur. Yeah. Stop fucking growing, bro. Yeah. Build some processes, build some systems. You got no foundation, you know? Take a, take a breather. You got here, celebrate it, stabilize it, hire, build processes, 
And then now build a plan to go to the next level. And what is the next level? Because we didn't even know where the fuck we wanted to go. We were just like, grow, 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 yeah. all cost. And that is one of the, 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 you know, it's like slow is fast. That is one of the most dangerous things that every entrepreneur will be faced in their journey. And one of the toughest decisions, especially when you just came out of like the best year of your life and you're being told to slow the fuck down. It's like, what are you talking about, dude? Like, hell no. But I think that's where it takes a level of maturity, a level of wisdom to say no that I did not have two years ago. And unfortunately, I had to touch the stove to find out that it's hot for me to realize that, okay, well, I know now that if that happened again, I need to slow down, stabilize, and then scale. You got to clean up your mess. Yeah. So part of it, it sounds like is the processes, maybe team. So <laughs> having leaders in place that can take stuff off your plate, you know, at a massive scale. I guess I'm curious what your take is on this. Recently, we've seen Alex Becker stop doing internet marketing, went to high roast. You saw Sam Evans. He's doing school. Alex Ramosi, obviously he just invested. Do you feel, Hey, if I just had these processes in place, this team in place, we'd still be going. Or do you feel at least in my opinion, at some, in some businesses you have quote unquote ceilings where you can get to this level and some people may break it, but it gets really difficult because of, you know, X, Y, Z reasons. I'm curious your take on that because I think in some industries, maybe it's just, that's kind of the level you're going to get to. Sure. Maybe you won't get higher. Or do you just think, Hey, I honestly just think if I had those things in place, maybe we won't have that snag. Um, I think I'm the, uh, I'm the touchy feely guy. So I think first, it needs to start with your why. What's your vision? Where do you want to go? And why do you want to go there? What is it that you want to do? Because to some people, maybe, you know, I heard you, I saw uh, one of your videos where you were like, it's at $30 million a year and it kind of gets stuck mm -hmm. here. We say $30 million like it's bad. Dude, that's 30 fucking million dollars. I, I saw, I was just kind of like uh, messing around with Google the other day. And I think it was like 1% of businesses ever make a million dollars a year. Crazy. And then like 0.1% of businesses ever make $10 million a year. You're talking about three times that, bro. Yeah. The 1% of the 1%. Like, what's wrong with 30 million, right? Yeah. And to some people, it's like, I, I don't even know what to do or how to think with 30 million, right? But that's why it starts with what is your why and what is your vision? For me, eight, nine years ago, I need to clear my debt. I need to marry the love of my life. I need to, you know, make my parents proud and retire them. Right now, it's different. Right now, every time I think of achieving my, our goals and like I get emotional, it's not like I'm going to buy the car. I'm going to buy the this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It's I'm going to give these bonuses. I'm going to buy this for that person. I'm going to take that. I'm going to pay off this person's like these are the and not like not like that's what I lead myself to think is just these are the the first thoughts that come to my mind and i and i sit there and i you know whenever i'm manifesting and stuff like I just sit there and i get very emotional and start crying about it you know but that's what in my core i want to do my personal mission in life is to create a lasting impact and what that means is i want something beyond my years lives on that has created an impact on people's lives right when I think of impact, I think of someone like the Wright brothers. I think of someone like Walt Disney. I think of someone like Steve Jobs. These guys have been dead. You know, Steve Jobs, 15 years, Wright brothers for 100 plus years, Walt Disney, I don't know, 50, 60 years. And the thing that they created continues to live on. When Elon Musk dies, when Jeff Bezos dies, the things that they have created will continue to live on, right? Even maybe not the thing, like maybe Amazon will, will crash and burn, but the fact that e-commerce now exists I mean, I could argue that it existed because of Jeff Bezos, right? Okay. Uh, uh, Uber exists because of these guys. I don't even know who the, the, the founders are, you know? All these things, all these creations existed because these people took risk and they went in and they made it happen. You get to a certain point where it's like, dude, how big of a house are you going to have? How mm -hmm. many trips are you going to take? How many millions in the bank are you going to have? And if that's the only thing... It'll get to a point where it's like, fuck this business, I'm going to start here. No, not this, not that. So I think it has to come back to the mission for, you know, for someone like Sam Ovens, for example, his mission was, I remember, to educate Earth. That's what he wanted to do. So for him, he realized that first, it's not fun scaling a consulting business because the way he did it was kind of similar to how I did it a couple of years ago. And he wasn't having fun. He wasn't enjoying it. And he realized that there is 
a bigger impact to be made in a different way. So that's when he came up with a, with the uh, idea of school. I don't know what Alex Becker's uh, mission is. Yeah. Do you know it? I mean, I don't, honestly. I, yeah. I, I think from what I've seen, mostly he just talks about the grind of consulting and yeah. he wanted to build something that you know, it was more scalable and the tracking was a big pain point. I don't know, T- to be frank, when I, w- I, I, I haven't had too many interactions with him. I've talked to him a couple of times, but I know he's very hyper-focused on just being the best he can be, especially recently. He's gotten really into biohacking and his health. Yeah. I, I don't know. What it, I, I don't, I couldn't tell you, to be honest. No. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe that's his mission, you know, to live 200 years. I don't know, but you know, it's like, what <laughs> is Brian Johnson? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, what's your mission in life? So for me, it's to create a lasting impact. And the way that I know how to create a lasting impact right now is through BJK university. Mm. It's through providing them skills. They can turn into, into and turn into income within 90 days or less. Right. And so for us right now, that skill is Amazon FBA, but starting next year, we're going to branch into other skills serving the same avatar. And we have a, a, a five-year vision. I want to turn uh, BJK University into a $500 million valuation company wow. to where it has 12 different verticals. And we can get into that a little bit more. But then, you know, you can ask, well, why $500 million? It's because I can serve about twenty to 30,000 people per year, number one. Number two, it's because I could have about 500 employees in that company and then I know that I'm impacting their lives as well as my clients' lives, you know? Yeah. In terms of those different verticals, let's say you said real estate was one of them. Do you know what type? So what could it be, for example, just to get an idea, it wouldn't be more product-based like Amazon. Real estate might be teaching them how to wholesale. Yeah. Or, so, so it's going to be different types of consulting, essentially, correct? Yeah. I mean, anything. Like, I think of, um, I think of school, for example. Mm-hmm. People go to universities. And they get a degree, not because they're passionate about engineering or because they're passionate about this or that. Maybe some of them are, Mm. but I think most of them get it to get a job, but it's really not to get a job. It's what the job is going to do for them. What's the end result? They want better life. Unfortunately, the universities have had a monopoly at a better life for centuries. And unfortunately, universities cost a lot more and take a lot longer than a better life should require. And so for us, we want to provide people a skill they can turn into income within 90 days or less at a fraction of the cost. Yeah. You know, something I respect about you, and and I think I forgot to hit on this is, you know, Bashar mentioned he was selling it, let's just say between three to five grand. (laughs) To hit 2 million a month at selling something at three to five grand is pretty much unheard of. I mean, most people... I would say that get past the 2 million a month mark in this industry, they have a massive back end, something 50,000, 60,000, 100,000, because it gets really expensive to run that team and so forth. Um, so to go back to BJK, is your hope and vision that it almost replaces college or like going to school in the sense of that would be almost the college education or how, what's your vision for that? Our mission is to impact 1 million lives at a time by disrupting the education system. Wow. And I, and so, I, I mean, I was going to ask you, my, I was going to ask you earlier if, you know, you ever see yourself branching out from BJK, but it sounds like that your next five-year plan is that, do you, do you ever see yourself doing anything else or? For the next five years? No. no. Um, but that's why I'm building the, right now it was, the setback was blessing in disguise because now I'm building BJK university where it doesn't rely on me anymore. So I am introducing new faces. I'm introducing, you know, I'm building an executive team that can run without me. Um, in the next couple of years, we're next 12, 24, yeah, 12, 18 months, we're going to be bringing in a CEO that takes over the day-to-day from me. And so in five years, I want BJK University to be set up for exit or to be exitable, not because I want to exit it, just because I want it to be able to run without me. Because sure. if the company is exitable, that means I am no longer valuable to the company. And I heard this quote last year by Roland Frazier. I had a one-on-one with him. He said, the more valuable you are to your company, the less valuable your company is. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit. Yeah. I am very valuable to my company right now. And it's very unvaluable, you know? Yeah. And so I want to build it to where the company, I am no longer in value to my company and it can just do it by itself. Yeah. Because the thing is, because my personal mission is to create a lasting impact, today I know how to do that through BJK University. In five years, I might wake up and find that there is a bigger impact to be made somewhere else, and I don't want to be stuck. I want to be able to hand it off and have someone continue my mission 
and my vision with it while I go in and create an impact somewhere else. Yeah. And I'm excited for you because that vision and that goal, I think it's a very worthy one and it's, it's difficult. I actually tried to step out unsuccessfully. I don't know if we talked about that much, but yeah. it's, uh, it, I think it's, nece- I think it's necessary, but it's definitely going to get you to that next level. I think in personal development, business savvy, everything. I want to talk a little personal development. You seem to have, for lack of a better word, your shit together. You know, you've been married how long now? Six years. Six years. So, you know, you've had, I'd say, well, you start having a little bit of success, but I I would say as you start having success, uh, especially being in, you know, a city like Miami, people can get carried away with that. They get drawn down different paths. Maybe they start getting different struggles. You know, I'd even say in Miami, sometimes for some people, even staying in a relationship can be difficult. Is there any advice you'd give or things that you've done that have (laughs) made you stay so focused? Because I know that's the word of the day, but it's, I find that very fascinating when I meet someone who seems just so focused on their mission, they don't get distracted. Um, From what I can tell, you have a pretty, you know, drama free life. You know, I don't see anything on the outside that would suggest otherwise. Is there any advice you give or things you'd focus on if someone is listening to a younger guy that's really helped you get to where you're at? I promise Sam Evans is not sponsoring this episode, but uh, <laughs> one of the first calls that I got on with him, 2020, I asked him and I said, hey, um, what does your wife do? Because in my mind, I thought I wanted, I five years ago, if you had asked me, I would have said I want a relationship like Alex and Layla Harmozy. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the kind of partner that I want. Like wanted. on that, on the outside where like she's in it with you. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. That's how I, that's what I thought. Yeah. And then after I got married and everything, I quickly realized that's not my wife. That's just not who she is. And for the first two years, I was trying to mold her into being that, mm. but that's just not who she was. And we used to fight all the time. What she wants is she wants to raise kids. That's all she wants to do in her life. And I don't know where I heard this the other day. It was like, well, I don't think there is a bigger job than raising the next generation. Like we say that's all she wants, but it's like, dude, that's like the biggest fucking job anyone could have in this world. (laughs) Literally raising the next generation, raising like continuing your legacy. Would you rather have that or have her, you know, have a career and maybe make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year or something? Maybe Mm -hmm. have her in your company where you can replace her with a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Like, which one is more important? Like, of course, raising my kids, you know? Mm-hmm. So I asked Sam and I said, hey, what does your wife do? And I was expecting he's going to say she's my CFO or some shit, you know, or like she has this thing. Or <laughs> He's like, she's, uh, I think she's, he said she's an artist or something. He's like, she likes art and she draws and, you know, she takes care of the house and stuff like that. I'm like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? I'm like, so your wife is now this like crazy entrepreneur and, you know, I'm like, how the fuck did you get married to her? It's like every human has two lives, especially entrepreneurs. We have our business life and professional life, and we have our personal and home life. Only one of those lives can be chaotic at any given time. As an entrepreneur, your professional life will always be chaotic because you're always doing all kind of crazy shit. Instagram page going down out of nowhere, you know, for you to focus and perform in your professional life, your personal life must be perfect, mm. drama free. That's my wife. That's what my wife does for me. She provides me a, a life that is free of drama. Since that day, the way I saw my wife completely shifted. I started seeing her. It used to be like, why the fuck did I marry this girl? To like, you are the reason why I am successful. Oh. And then when I looked back and tracked back, The day I married her, the day I married her, which was March 3rd, 2018, I made my first $21,000. I actually came out of it with with $21,000 in net profit in my hand that day. And since then, it's only been up. Because she brings that different energy into the relationship that I otherwise wouldn't have had, and she brings that subtleness and that focus to the inner, to the, to the relationship. So that way I can go out there and get bloody and fucking get beat up. And then I know that if I come home, I've got a shoulder to cry on, Mm. you know, that I'm not going to be faced with fucking drama and shit at home. And that's what my wife does. When people ask me, what does she do for you? I'm like, she is my CCO. 
And they said, what is that? I'm like, she's my chief cheerleading officer. <laughs> I love it, man. So for if a young guy's watching this, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, it's also different opinions or choices. But, you know, if a guy is, you know, <clears throat> let's say you use Alex and Layla, he may be thinking, hey, should I go for Layla or I go for, you know, the CCO? As you said, I like that. Is there is there anything that you would say in that regard or, or do you think it's just more was it a shift in your mindset? Was it was it more the fact that once you had made that decision to get married and you were married that you just shifted your mindset about the whole situation or what what's like the key takeaway there? <clears throat> if you have good intentions in life, good things will happen to you. And there is without getting biblical here, but there is a picture. Um, it's supposed to be God, Jesus, whatever you mm -hmm. believe in, that's uh, kneeling down. And there's this child that has this teddy bear in her hand and he has a bigger teddy bear behind his back. Mm -hmm. And he's like, give me that. And she's like, but God, I love it. But he's got a bigger teddy bear in the back. Sometimes on the path to achieving our goals, we lose track and we find a bigger goal. We find a bigger mission. We find a bigger cause. When I was seven years old, I got this this bad, bad injury in my foot and uh, we're being driven to the hospital and I'm like crying and bitching and saying how the world is all against me and I don't know what the hell was going on. My older brother whispers in my ear and he says, it's okay, don't worry. Everything happens for a reason. And this is the one piece of advice that I've always taken uh, 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 you know, around my life, especially when my restaurant burned down. And at the time it's like, what the fuck is the reason? But I found out three, four years later. Regardless what it is you're doing, as long as you have good intentions, things will happen to you that don't make sense, but it all happens for a reason. And just understand this, you need to have a target. You need to have a goal. You need to have a life. So for Alex, I don't know what he wanted. And maybe he wanted something completely different, and then he found Layla. Mm -hmm. Or maybe he wanted Layla and he got Layla. I don't know. Mm -hmm. If you have good intentions, just know that good things will happen to you. And sometimes it's completely different than what you thought was going to be. You just have to have a goal so that way you have something you're driving towards because you can't sit on your couch and say, well, I've got good intentions, good things will happen to me, and I'm just kind of waiting here. That doesn't work that way. you got to bust your ass. you got to get yourself out there, and you have to work hard, right? Um, but if you get diverted, just understand there is something bigger on the other side. Bashar, thanks so much for sharing what you have today. If someone <laughs> wants to find out more about you, get in BJK, where can they find you? Um, we actually created a uh, page special for these episodes. Just go to bjkpodcast.com. That's bjkpodcast.com. And there's a bunch of free resources and stuff like that. There. Awesome, dude. Pleasure having you here. Thanks yeah, for Yeah, thanks, coming. man. Appreciate it.